Good morning and welcome to Harrogate Vineyard Sunday service. I'm Maggie and this is Nick. Hello. And we lead the church together and it's uh, lovely to see you all joining us this morning. Yes, smashing. It is really good to see you. Um, and uh, we just got a few notices we just wanted to start with um, before we then go into a time of worship and then we're going to have uh, Judith's going to be preaching this morning, which would be really, really good to listen to. Um, so firstly, we love uh, the unity that we experience amongst the churches in Harrogate. And we were really, really blessed this week to be part of a huge online Zoom call with year six children from across Harrogate. Um, because they haven't been able to have any high school transition days um, for these children who are going to be going into year seven in September, um, going into new schools, um, we ran a joint meetup on Zoom um, with leaders from many churches and also with some lovely <laughs> year seven pupils as well who were brilliant. Um, so we, we got together with children going into different schools across Harrogate and we were providing them with hints, tips and encouragement on how to start well and have confidence as they go into a brand new school. Mm. And it was great. It was wonderful to see kids supported in a in a new way by churches working together in unity and it was such a blessing oh that's a fantastic mm. thing and uh, we also we know that uh, many of you will be aware of the changes in government guidance that are being uh, released and um, although some lockdown restrictions about meeting together as a church are changing we're not going to rush back into meeting together yet uh, we'd love to be all together with you as before mm. but there are several things that we need to take into account before we do that. Yeah. Um, firstly, we need to be able to access the chapel at St Aidan's, which is still not in use, even for school lessons, um, it's locked. And the level of access and deep cleaning required for us to use the building would be quite a stretch for the school right now. They're already flat out planning um, for getting all the kids back first in September. Yeah, and also we're, um, we're aware that there's um, the guidelines uh, that we're currently working within state that there's a maximum number of people who could actually meet in person and also that we wouldn't be allowed to, to sing. Mm. Um, plus, you know, there are quite a few in our community who are still shielding or vulnerable as well. Um, so we, we've got a load of stuff to take into account and we want to assure you that we are planning to meet up again as soon as is possible and safe and practical. Yeah. But we're not going to rush back and we're just going to keep you updated as news um, and further events unfold. Yeah. So we'll, we'll let you know when we know. <laughs> um, but we just wanted to make sure that we approach this in a wise way. Yeah. OK. OK. So something a little bit more positive than that, mm -hmm. maybe, is um, something that's really, really close to our hearts is the practical support that we as a church are able to give to the Women's Refuge. And your generous giving means that we're able to provide some welcome boxes yes. for new families who will be shortly arriving at the refuge. And we can't bring these to you in person to show you. So we thought we'd show you some of the stuff that goes into a welcome box. And here so we have. Here we have the beginnings of a welcome box. So we have got, uh, this is just some examples. We have a bale of towels. And then we've got um, some plates and crockery. Some bed sheets. <laughs> Pots and pans. Some mugs. Everyone needs mugs. I think you get the more exciting ones. Uh, cutlery. All of these things are really key and important. I pick these ones up and then we go <laughs> some toiletries. And then some chocolates as well. So we've kind of, basically what we're doing is we're providing for um, each new family. We've got um, uh, new families that are joining and um, they often will be arriving without some of those essentials. Yeah. So we've made sure that we've got some essentials. You know, we may not be ticking every single box, but it, what it means is that um, as they arrive, they recognise that um, there are people there who are showing them that they are loved and they are being thought of in what is probably a turbulent and difficult time. And we really, really appreciate that... Um, the reason we are able to be supporting these families is because you guys are giving above and beyond mm. your regular giving to, to provide us with this opportunity for such generosity. Um, we are going to continue to do this. Yep. It's um, 
something that we know is uh, really deeply on so many of your hearts. And um, if you'd like to give a financial gift um, to this ongoing Compassion Ministry, then the details are on our website. Um, they should hopefully be on the screen right now as well. Um, <laughs> www.harrogatevineyard.org.uk slash giving to HBC. Okay, um, so if you do that, um, basically just put your name and put refuge in the uh, reference as well. And then we know that that links up. So we would really appreciate that because unfortunately we do know that there are going there are to be more families that are going to need this support yeah. so we're going to continue with that awesome. thank you and finally there is no coffee and chat after the service this week because we'd love you to join us at seven o'clock this mm. evening with your friends and family for the next hvc quiz on zoom hey. um, hosted by ian and joy reevey and you should have received an invite on an email yes and so it's it's props Sunday, isn't it? <laughs> there really Here we is. go. There is a crown and a trophy for the winners. And as always, we're going to be having a tombola <laughs> with a choice of exciting prizes. Um, maybe you might choose a box of chocolates, or maybe one of the snazzy gliders that we provide, yeah. or even we've even got the exciting new entry. The blank Rubik's Cube. Oh, the possibilities it's are endless. very exciting. Apparently, it's one that you can actually colour in yeah. as well. So you do that or just keep it blank and then you'll always win and you'll always get it done really, oh. really fast. <laughs> oh, I'm going to get you one for your next birthday. Yes. Oh. So um, Nick is going to lead us in some worship with three simple songs before we pass on to Judith with our next talk in our Connected Sermon series. Super. So I will grab my guitar. So again, as usual, uh, hopefully you should have the words and maybe the words and chords if you're playing along at home um, that we've emailed out. Um, but also the words are going to be on the screen. So please do sing along. This is a moment where we just stop. We still ourselves and we invite the presence of God to draw near to us. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would draw near to each one of us in whatever location we are right now. And we pray that as we take these moments to focus on you, as we worship together now and then as we listen to Judith's talk, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would move, that you would stir our hearts, that you would stir our minds and that as we reach out to you, that you would reach out to us. So calm, Holy Spirit. And we just want to bless you and we want to honour you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, who are thirsty. Oh, who are we? Come to the fountain.
You are solid rock beneath my feet. So finds rest in you. And everything I hope for comes from you. My strength and my rest. Solid rock beneath my feet, my soul finds rest in you, and everything I hope for comes from you, the strength of my refuge. Hope and glory are found in
So Lord, we come before you. Lord, we are hungry and thirsty for more of you, for more of your presence, more of your peace, more of your mercy and more of your compassion. We surrender to you. We, we lay our lives before you. And we say, Lord, as we trust in you, as we surrender to you, would you come? Would you fill us with compassion? Fill us with your spirit and empower us to be a non-anxious presence in the lives of those around us. Empower us to be uh, filled with your blessing so that we can bless others. And let us walk in your light so that we can be a light to others. We bless you and we thank you in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. So thank you for worshipping with us this morning and um, I'd like to hand over now to Judith. Thanks very much. Good morning everyone. As we're moving through our series on being connected, I wonder whether you have any stories or insights you would like to share with us. Although lockdown is now easing and we are entering a new phase of living with the pandemic, I wonder are you returning to your pre-pandemic way of life? Or have you made changes? And if you've made changes, are they because of your health or the health of someone you live with? I ask this because today's talk is Making Connections, Called to Serve. And my initial response to this was, crikey, how do we serve when we can't meet? We don't need a set up or a set down team on a Sunday morning. We don't need a rotor for kids work or a coffee rotor. Church, as we know it, has been cancelled. And I have to confess, I spent a few days wondering how being church will look now that being together under one roof had been taken away. And then I remembered, there was no set up or set down when the church started 2000 years ago. There were no coffee rotors. There was no kids work. The way of doing and being a church as we knew it was not being turned on its head, but rather how we behave as a group is being returned to its roots. When John Wimber, founder of the Vineyard Movement, first started attending church, he asked the minister as he was leaving a meeting, when do we get to do the stuff? He was referring to the stuff that Jesus did, healing the sick, making the blind see, the lame walk, making the deaf hear. This life-changing, kingdom-building stuff that he'd read about in the Gospels. In John 14 verse 12, Jesus said, I am telling you the truth. Those who believe in me will do what I do. Yes, they will do even greater things. John Wimber was taking Jesus at his word. And that made me think. Whilst there's a place for coffee rotors and children's rotors and setting up and taking down, the space where we have been gathering, that is only a tiny part of what being connected in community, called to serve, means. Last week, Maggie spoke about unity. As a backdrop, she used the story in Mark 12, where one of the Pharisees asks Jesus, which was the greatest commandment? And Jesus' reply was that the most important commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And that the second most important one, which flows from the first, is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. We are to be united in our love for God and our love for our fellow people. As Maggie said, we all hold different views. We all have different experiences, but we are called to unity in love. Love should overarch and undergird our connections with others. And it's serving in that context of love and from a place of love that I'd like to explore this morning. One of the key values in the vineyard is every person ministry. The phrase we use is everyone gets to play. As followers of Jesus, we move beyond belief and relationship with Jesus and put that belief into action for others. It's not about telling others what to believe, but more about showing how that believing affects the way we live our lives. 
In her talk on unity, Maggie spoke about the importance of recognising that we're all different. We all do things differently. We all think differently. We all see differently. From personal experience, I know that if you and I were to witness a crime, we may tell similar stories, but they would be different. And that is the point. The way I've been created, my abilities, interests and way of looking at life are all unique to me. We may both be following Jesus and in following Jesus, we are called to serve God. But each individual's outworking of serving God will be different. One aspect that will be common to us all is found in Matthew 6 verse 24, where Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. In the King James Version, the word used for money is mammon. We are all called to serve God with undivided loyalty, and that can be easier said than done. I don't think Jesus is condemning money per se, but I do think he's saying that if money becomes my whole focus, if accruing wealth for wealth's sake is my sole aim, then I need to rethink my values. The word mammon in Matthew 6 is used to describe the debasing influence of material wealth, the power that money can hold over us, and the power that we may believe we have if we have money. Power to influence decisions so that our friends benefit unjustly, or to put others under pressure to do something they wouldn't otherwise do, or to bribe officials. It's not that being wealthy is wrong, it's the place of that wealth in my thoughts and innermost being that nudges God away. That is the problem. When I look over my life at choices I have made, can I honestly say that I have served God with undivided loyalty? No, I don't think I can. When my focus has shifted, it's been through small, imperceptible decisions I have made. Each decision has created the right environment for another tiny decision. And before I've known it, I've been brought up short and realised that I have started to become numb to the Holy Spirit and his promptings. This has sometimes become manifest in the way I've thought about others or how I've treated them or my choice of words. The central point of undivided loyalty is like the nervous system that runs through our bodies, alerting our senses to what's going on around us so we can respond. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul likens the church to the human body, explaining that just as a human body is made up of many parts, so too is the body of Christ, the church. In verse 27, he writes, you are Christ's body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only you accept your part of the body. Does your part mean anything? If we think of what Paul says in the context of how we serve, what part we play, as it were, we can see that whilst we are all called to serve God with undivided loyalty, we are not all called to serve him in the same way. Again, Paul says in chapter 12, but it's obvious by now, isn't it, that Christ's church is a complete body and not a gigantic unidimensional part. It's not all apostle, not all prophet, not all miracle worker, not all healer, not all prayer in tongues, not all interpreter of tongues. And yet some of you keep competing for so-called important parts. That last phrase, and some of you keep competing for so-called important parts, seems tinged with sadness to me. Why? Because I think there's a certain sense of security if we can rank some things as more important than others. So we can then climb up the ranks. Paul tells us this ranking is wrong. 
For me, one of the attractions of following Jesus is that all kinds of things that we think are important are thrown into the wind. In the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, educated or not. You have an equal part to play. And that part is to bring others into the embrace of love that Jesus has for us. In Ephesians 4 verse 12a, the responsibility of the church is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church so that as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That's Ephesians 4 verse 16. If the church is a band of followers of Jesus coming together to do life, sharing joys and heartache, triumphs and failures, finding that sometimes the road is smooth and at others it's full of bumps and potholes, we need everyone to join in, regardless of whether they think their contribution is important or not, so that we can all grow together into a healthy body. But it doesn't stop with the church. We are told in Matthew 28 verse 19 to go make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our serving of God is purposeful. It is not self-serving, but it acts as a catalyst by which all nations, that is other people, see the love of God working in our lives and want to experience that love for themselves. If ministry is a carrying out of activities to express or to spread faith, then service, which is the performance of loving acts where we leave the results to God, is an integral part of it. We each serve God and by doing so, we each serve one another and we all serve the world. We then stand back as God brings results. Or as, or as Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 6, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Seeing love in action is tantalising. Have you ever waited for someone at an airport or a train station and watched families being reunited or lovers meeting again after a break? The look of anticipation on the face of each person, that slightly worried, are they here for me, look, as they scan the throng of people in the arrivals hall and the look of sheer joy as they're reunited. The picture I have in my mind is of an arm reaching around the traveller's weary shoulder and Father God's smile radiating love as he welcomes the traveller home. I see the act of service as an introduction, as it were, and the final recognition on the traveller's face as the moment they step into the embrace of Jesus. The introduction and recognition of the embrace may be separated by years. But the act that plants a seed is every bit as important as a subsequent act that waters the seed so that God can propagate and nurture it to growth. We all have seeds in us, planted by other followers of Jesus. Some of those seeds will have been planted many years ago and those who planted them may never see the results. And we may never see the results of what we have planted. And that is not a reason to not plant. It's not a reason to stop serving. We serve believing that God will do his part in his time. If we don't serve, then the life-changing message of the gospel stays locked up. It's like seeds in a packet. And that life-changing, life-giving message is reduced to little more than empty words on a page. One of the things I love about the vineyard is this value that everyone gets to play. It's steeped in New Testament theology. Everyone has something to offer. Everyone can do the stuff, perform acts out of love and step back 
to allow God to do his stuff. And by doing that, hearts and lives are transformed and the kingdom of God comes closer. It doesn't matter whether you're a child or a senior citizen, whether you command an audience of millions or hold the attention of one. I don't know whether it could be called a movement, but every so often on social media, people will be asked to post up their acts of kindness. Acts of kindness have been a thing in the vineyard for a number of years. We've been encouraged to do something for a stranger simply to express that God loves them and without expecting anything back. These acts of kindness are not served on believers, but on random strangers, the man in the supermarket queue or the lady at the bus stop. The purpose of them is to share God's love with others. And I have been amazed at how God has used these acts to bless the recipient. We have heard of unexpressed needs being unexpectedly met. We've heard of healings. That positive endorsement where God steps in at the place we step out builds faith. The body is built up. And someone perhaps experiences God's love for the first time. When we put belief into action through acts of service, faith becomes dynamic. The church is strengthened and we are encouraged to go on doing more acts of service, bringing more into the embrace of Jesus. I'd like to close with a short prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are the God who loves to step in when we step aside. Help us to be encouraged, to see what you are doing in the lives of those around us, so we can keep on serving you, doing what you have called us to do. Thank you that you know that some of us are weary. We've served you for so long and we've seen so little result. Help us to see new shoots peeking through. Give us hope and encouragement, knowing that what we plant in your service will come to fruition. Thank you that you know that some of us are anxious, anxious that the world that we know has changed. And we don't know we can't see how the future will be. Calm the storms within us, please, so that we can carry on serving you, confident that all will be well. And may your peace and your love pervade each moment of each day. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Goodbye and have a great week.